you know, that is a noise I'll never forget. And that's the kickoff. And then I run that dot back. And if one of those other dots touches it, it, it does that. It's really pretty simple, huh? It doesn't look very exciting, does it? Things have changed. You know, lots of things change, Kira. Like the weather changes around here a lot, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know what? People change too, don't they? You're changing. Every time I see you, you're probably about a quarter of an inch taller than the last time, it seems like. And you get stronger and you get smarter and lots of things changes. But did you know, have you ever thought about the fact that God, God never, ever changes? You know why he never changes? Because he's perfect already. So if you're perfect, you don't ever change. And he's always been perfect. And he will always be perfect. And that's really important because when you go to God, he's not going to be different tomorrow or in 10 years than he was 10,000 years ago. He's the same always. In fact, it says that in Hebrews 13, 8. It says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So no matter how old you get, God's going to be the same. He's going to be faithful. He's going to be loving. He's going to have grace. He's going to know everything. He's going to have, be all-powerful. And he is going to know um, the future as well as the past. And he's going to love you just the same. And I think that, Kira, is pretty cool. Some things change, and, and I guess they probably need to. Because Mattel Electronics didn't keep the corner on handheld games, did they? The DS got it. Yeah, pretty cool. But God is already cool. So you know what? Let's pray and thank him for that. Will you do that with me? Father, thank you for being the same. Thank you for being the same in, in the fact that you're perfect already. There's nothing that could change or evolve or transition because you are who you are. You've always been perfect and you will always be perfect. So that if Kira lives to be 120 years old, you're going to be the same God in her life as you are today. Your love for her is perfect and it will always be that way. And I thank you, Father. Thank you for things that do change and that need to change. Lord, we love the changes of the season. Uh, right now we're looking forward to spring. But God, when spring gives way to summer, we'll look forward to that. And summer gives way to fall, we'll look forward to that. And next fall, we'll look forward to the winter again. And we thank you for it. You are a good God, and you're perfect in every way. And we celebrate the fact that we can count on you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate right. you being up here. Let's go ahead and stand and join together in singing how our God, he never lets go of us. of the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me whom then shall I fear whom then shall I fear oh no you never let go and through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let go and every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me he's light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare there will be a dent to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and I will oh for my God is with me if my God is with me 
then shall I fear, whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go, and through the calm and through the storm, oh no, you never let go, in every high and every low, oh no, you never let go, oh no, you never let go of me. never let go and ever come and through the storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go oh lord you never let go of me troubles until that day comes I, I will praise you still I will praise you oh, oh no you never let go and through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let go and every high and every low Never let go
be seated. a song that I love. It's just a constant reminder that God's right there with us through everything. Um, no matter where we're at, what we're doing, God's there. And he's the, the hand that we can lean on. So. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you, guys. We're in this series called Right Next Door, talking about 
taking Jesus literally when he said, go love your neighbor, meaning the person who does live next door. I was thinking about neighbors that I've had over the years. <laughs> and some of it's terrifying, and some of it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, I can remember everything from a neighbor who uh, literally shot and killed my dog to neighbors who told their kids that if we did something wrong, and this was when I was a kid, uh, they could get a two-by-four and just beat us to pulp. <laughs> That's what the parents told them. These are my neighbors. Uh, my dad was an ornithologist, so he was uh, like he taught uh, at the college level on birds. And so most people know that you're not supposed to shoot owls, but my neighbor didn't. He brought them home and showed my dad. <laughs> he was not real. I remember that. He was like, oh, my gosh. I remember... I remember neighbors who stole from us. I remember neighbors who, uh, who lied. I remember a lot of the hard stuff. But I also remember who, neighbors who were there when things got really hard. And I remember neighbors who, who were considerate and thoughtful. The deal is, is you don't get to choose, do you? Not necessarily who lives next to you. And even if you do choose when you move in based on who neighbors are, you can't make sure that they're going to stay there. And you know what? We shouldn't be able to. We shouldn't want to handpick because loving people is always going to be messy. It's always going to be hard. There are always going to be the people that are difficult for us. And it's, and it's challenging to say the least. But you know what we have to remember? Is that on the other side of the fence, we're the neighbor that's probably challenging. We can be the neighbor that's quirky. We can be the neighbor that's inconsiderate or thoughtless. So we have to remember as we try to love neighbors, literally, that we have to be the neighbor that we would want to have. Okay, let's always keep this focus on who we are and making sure that we're not projecting constantly over the fence. God's plan of loving our neighbors like we love ourselves is masterful. It is profound. It is powerful. But I think it's often overlooked because of its simplicity. I think the church has tried a thousand gimmicks and a thousand programs and a thousand outreach strategies, to say the least, and all the while overlooked in this very simple statement of go, love your neighbor just like you love yourself. For some reason, we think God's plans are always complicated. They've got to be huge. There has to be a strategic plan in place, and that there has to be a strategic initiative, and they're hard to understand, and they take lots of money and time and effort and people to roll out the programs and the plans. But when it comes to the most important thing that we can do on planet Earth, God says it's really simple. Go next door and treat them like you would want to be treated. Think about them like you would want to be thought of. Talk about them like you would want to be talked of. See, the mission of leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus does seem massive. And it is. It's massive in scope and it's massive in, in significance. Get that. But the plan that God gives us for carrying that out is profoundly simple. And we've all largely overlooked it. God's plan for how we can be, make if disciples in the most effective, in the most uh, simple way starts with loving our neighbors just like we love ourselves. Doesn't take any teaching. Doesn't take any planning per se. Doesn't take a meeting of the church. Doesn't take a funding of a program. It doesn't take a leadership team. It just simply says, love your neighbor like you love yourself. So it tells us what we're supposed to do to love. It tells us who we're supposed to love, our neighbor, and it tells us how we're supposed to love them, just like we love ourselves. And, and that's all the explanation, truly, that we need for this initiative. It's called the Great Commandment. There are two major obstacles. See, understanding the mission is not the hard part there. Understanding the commandment is very, very simple. But we've said that there are two major obstacles, and they are massive roadblocks to the church in America we're doing what God has asked us to do. This most simple thing of loving our neighbors has some massive, massive roadblocks in the way. Even though this is simple, loving neighbors is simple. Getting there is not simple. And we said the last, last week we said the first major roadblock was time. That we, we all have 24 hours, but it's a matter of how we use those 24 hours. And that the fact of the, the pace of life in the United States of America is exponentially fast that we're living on borrowed time constantly, that we very seldom have time to connect with our own families, much less with people that we don't even know. 
So time is a massive, massive roadblock. And we challenge you in one aspect of a time killer is technology, especially technology from the time periods of 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock, which is probably the most opportune time for you and I to meet and connect with a neighbor. So we asked you to do a technology time use sheet last week. If you did that and you brought it back with you, we have a little basket back there by, uh, right by Richard. One of our deacons is standing back there. And you could put it in there on the way out. If you didn't get that done, still do it. Uh, I'll tell you, this week I found out uh, I don't use technology much during 5 to 9. Uh, I don't. I watch a little TV about a half hour, maybe an hour between those time frames. But uh, maybe I need to, I might be on the other end of the spectrum. I might need to use Facebook to find out what people are doing just a little bit. Uh, but maybe you found some stuff out. But technology is not the only time killer, and we're going to be dealing with that in hand and print, print out things and, and probably in future sermons, but we're going to have to move on to the next roadblock today. And the next roadblock is equally significant. It's equally as profound, and it's, it's just as much of a barricade to doing what God, is, what is, God has called us to. It's the roadblock of fear. And perhaps the most famous, the most profound quote ever on fear it was by uh, President Roosevelt. He said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. We've quoted that hopefully many times in our lives, maybe to ourselves. But if you think about what in the world he meant. The only thing we really have to fear is fear ourselves. You see, an enemy or an obstacle can only stop a person who is determined for so long. But fear can permanently paralyze us from ever even taking the initiative to start. Fear can literally be paralyzing. I know this from my own life, that in, in, in my greatest fear, my greatest fear is the fear of failure. I do not like to fail. So, no one does. I don't think anybody says, well, I enjoy failure. But I, I had this fear of failure, hopefully I'm overcoming, that was paralyzing to me. That is, I wouldn't even try something if I anticipated failure to be a significant outcome the potential of failure to be significant I wouldn't even try so it would stop me from ever trying and the greatest most successful people in this world if you read their biographies I haven't read a lot of them but I know enough to say this that the reason that they were successful is because they never let failure become an obstacle and they failed much the greatest inventors the greatest athletes the greatest thinkers of our time were all very very familiar with failure and they didn't fear it. And I'm sure that even though when we do fear things, and they did fear things, they pressed on through it. So the question today is this for us. How has fear hindered your ability to be a good neighbor? Now, I want to broaden that out. And also to say, how has fear incapacitated you personally? How has fear crippled you spiritually? How has fear maybe even put the damper on physical health? Because you were afraid you couldn't follow through and you didn't want to start another diet or exercise regime that you didn't think you could complete. Fear permeates a lot of our lives. Now, yeah, we're going to look at it from the perspective of how has it incapacitated us at times of being a good neighbor. But this realm of fear goes far beyond that and how it hurts us as a people. So fear's been a roadblock to following God since since sin came into the world, right? Because Adam and Adam's first response after sin, when he heard God walking in the garden, he hid, and God questions him on it, and he says, I was afraid. So fear has been a problem and separated God and man for a long, long time. Ever since sin has come into the world, ever since sin has come into the world. I can't think of a leader. I did this this week. I can't think of a leader that God raised up. I'm, there may be. But I can't think of one right now, a prominent leader that God raised up that didn't deal with a massive amount of fear on the front end. Everybody that I thought of had some hesitation, had some sense of fear. Most of them had a lot of fear. Israel was constantly led by reluctant and fearful leaders. 
Moses was one of those leaders. And we're going to go into this message today based on Moses and Joshua. And we're going to look at this passage today. It's in Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 through 8. But let me catch you up quickly on what the setting is here. Real, real quick setting catch up, all right? We're not going to do this long. Israel has already been to the point that we're going to be with them. Hey, they've already been at this point 40 years earlier. Uh, Moses has led them out of Egypt through the desert and at the brink of taking hold of the promised land that God has given them. He's led them right up to the border. They send 12 spies in and the spies go in and they spy out the land. Ten spies come back and say, no way, Jose. There is no way we're going into that land. It is well fortified. The walls are giant. They have well prepared armies and 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 by the way there are literal giants in that land we are like grasshoppers in their sight there's no way that land could ever be conquered by this petty untrained ill-equipped army can't happen two spies came back same experience same spy mission said absolutely we can their name was Joshua their names were Joshua and Caleb. They said, we can take the land. We must take the land. God promised us the land. But the ten spies stirred up Israel. Israel rebelled. And God sent them to wander in the desert for 40 years until that generation of leaders died off. And God raised up a new generation of leaders. Joshua and Caleb survived that. Moses survived that until that point at which we are catching up with them in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31. Find Deuteronomy chapter 31, and I'm going to do the same thing, verses 7 through 8, and then I'm going to have you stand as we read God's Word together. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 7 through 8. They are standing at the brink of taking the land that was promised to them long ago, and they have wandered 40 years after a prior failure. They're back. Moses has led them back. He's handing the reins over to Joshua. Here's what he says to Joshua. Moses called to Joshua and said to him, in the sight of all Israel, so he's saying this in front of all of Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with these people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. The Lord is one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Father, I pray that you would take this ancient text, this ancient historical story, and you would implant it in 2013 in Topeka, Kansas, in our hearts, so that we wouldn't just be informed, but we would be transformed as we encounter the truth, the timeless truth that Moses told Joshua that you are telling us today. We rest in your ability to do that through the power of the Spirit. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. In one word, what caused an entire generation of Israelites to miss out on the glory of entering the land promised to them by God was fear. The whole reason they didn't go in the first time is they were afraid. They were afraid for their physical lives. Now, we have to give it to them because we can sit here and second-guess them and play armchair quarterback and say, well, God promised it to you. You should have gone in. That's easy to say when we're sitting here in a nice warm sanctuary so, so far removed from their scenario and their situation. But I'm afraid that I would be too much like the ten spies and not enough like Joshua and Caleb just knowing my tendencies today knowing that I can see a promise from God, but let my circumstances override my confidence in the promise. I can see that tendency in me. But Joshua and Caleb are here to learn from today. They said absolutely not. We may be undersized. We may be ill-equipped. We may not look prepared enough. They may look invincible. But what we have, Joshua and Caleb said, is the promise of God to give us this land. So circumstances pale in comparison to the promise that God is giving. It's an incredible, incredible lesson. So I want us to see that Moses has this certain clarity. In verse 7, he speaks with such clarity. And there's no ifs, maybes. There's no conditional statements. to. He says, you're going in to give them this land. It's an inheritance that God promised their father. It's going to happen. Joshua, it's going to happen. Not if, Joshua, if you are strategic enough, Joshua, if you're courageous enough, not if anything, he says, you're going in, you're going to give them this land. It's a certain 
certain clarity. Moses' certainty wasn't, wasn't based on a confidence in Joshua or Caleb. He knew, Moses knew what was in the heart of a man. Moses' certainty was a direct result of his absolute confidence and the willingness to take God at his word regardless of his circumstances. It is such an easy thing for a preacher to say from a pulpit on Sunday morning. Trust God and not your circumstances. I don't know how many times I've said that to people, to myself, to my family. You can't let your circumstances dictate your willingness to follow God. You have to take him at his word and not take him at our circumstances. That's really different than when you're being told to march into enemy territory without the, without the battle equipment that you need against insurmountable odds when everything looks totally, totally dismal and yet you march in. But that's what they were being asked to do. That's still what Joshua and Caleb, and 40 years later, nothing had changed. The circumstances hadn't gotten better. The, the, the odds didn't look better from a circumstantial perspective. Not at all. Way back when God first called Moses, way, way back, many years before this time, when he called him to lead Israel out of slavery, Israel's still slaves in, in the land of Egypt, he gave him this very clear promise, and I'll read it to you from Exodus chapter 3, and verse 17. It says this, So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite. That's the promised land, the land of Canaan and the Hittite, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey, a way to describe a bountiful, good, friendly land. That was the promise. That promise drove Moses. That promise caused him to stand eyeball to eyeball with Joshua with great confidence and certainty and say, Joshua, you will go in, you will conquer, you will take the land. That promise. Not Joshua's preparedness. Not because the Israelites went into a 40, massive 40-year 40 training camp in the desert. They wandered around in the desert until people died. Until a new generation raised up. Then they brought them back. And Moses stands there because of the Exodus 3.17 promise and says it's going to happen. He lived and he led by that promise. So Moses was speaking with absolute certainty because he believed God was always going to be true to his word. And Joshua and Caleb had that same heart. So the next thing Moses told Joshua, the next words out of his mouth, were the things that he learned from the crucible of his experiences with God, which were many and, and varied in experience. From the heights of victory, like the, the crossing of the Red Sea, to the lowest point when he comes down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, and they've made a false god to worship. I mean, he has been there. He's been through all of this, and he gives Joshua this, this massive pep talk that didn't take very long. And it wasn't just, hey, you can do it. It wasn't just, hey, you know, just trust God, or, or even if you die, it's all right. It was really formulated from the heat of battle, so to speak. These are words that weren't theoretical in any spectrum. These are things that Moses learned in life. He passes them on to us today. And here's what he says. He says to Joshua, Joshua, God is going to go ahead of you. Okay? Joshua, don't be afraid because jo God is going to go ahead of you. He says the Lord is the one, in verse 8, the Lord is is the one he's the God he's the one who is able this is who he is the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you Joshua you are not going in there without somebody going in in advance the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you so Joshua God is already at work in the land that you're going to you're not going ahead of God's not sending you into the land he's inviting you into the land God is not sending you ahead of him God is calling you to join him where he already is you have to know that, Joshua. That changes your entire perspective when you feel like God's not behind you, behind you saying, hey, I got your back. You go ahead into the land versus you hear the voice of God in the darkness behind the walls that are fortified, behind the massive armies saying, come join me at work right here. God is going ahead of you, Joshua. He's not going to send you from a, the safety of a bunker. He's calling you to join him where he already is at work. Henry Blackaby does a great job 
of expounding on that truth in his teachings through experiencing God. Number two, he says, Joshua, God is not only going ahead of you, but God is going to be with you. Now, only an omnipresent God could do this. To call you to where he already is, but as you march towards his presence, you are going with him at the same time. We need an omni, all-present God to do this. To invite you to where he is, but as he invites you to where he is, he marches stride for stride with you. Moses told Joshua, he will be with you. Not theoretically, not metaphorically, hey, not like, hey, go for it, I'll be with you in spirit. But literally, he will be with you. His presence will encamp round about you. Every step you will take will be taken stride for stride with God. Think about that. So again, I, I do my best to take myself out of this pulpit and out of the Sunday morning scenario and think about what this truth means and do I really believe that God is going to be with me and, 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 and how this must have sounded to Joshua, okay, he's going to be there, but he's going to be here with me. And, and those two things combined are amazing truths if, if I believe them. Those are, those are absolutely empowering truths if I really believe them. If they're literal and not theologically just empty promises. If they're literal and not philosophical, philosophical. He's not calling you, Joshua, to find your way to where he is. He's not beckoning to you from the darkness saying, come grope around and find me. He's leading you through the darkness to where he already is because he's an omnipresent God. And that's what he can do, Joshua. And remember, Moses is speaking from what? From experience. He didn't read a book about this. He saw this happen. He saw it happen in the plagues. He saw it happen in the exodus. He saw it happen in the desert. He saw it happen time and time and time again. Now lastly, Joshua, you need to know that God's going to be where, you already, where, he, uh, where you're going. He's going to be with you as you go towards him. And God is not going to let you down. So he tells him, he says, Joshua, God will not fail you or forsake you God is telling Moses to tell Joshua I will not blow this for you see it's one thing to say hey I'm going ahead of you I'll be there when you get there I'm going with you you don't have to go alone and then to have this sneaking worry and this this suspicion in the back of your head but what if even though he's there and even though he's with me what if that obstacle is bigger than God well, of course we wouldn't say that in church on Sunday morning, would we? Because even the youngest among us spiritually would probably know theologically that's not true, that God is God, and no one's bigger than God, and no one can defeat God, and God doesn't fail. But that's not how we function. That's not always how we function. If we didn't have this fear that God would fail us, if that wasn't a sneaking suspicion, if that wasn't a lie that we sometimes believed, we would be storming the gates of hell today. But we're constantly battling this lie and trying to push it back, understanding that, that it's an untruth, but it still creeps in. It's, still, it's an insidious poison that seems to sometimes creep into our lives like a cancer and debilitate us. But Joshua is being told, says, listen, I need you to know that God never leads you into a situation, never leads you into a situation and then blows it for you. Joshua, you need to know that. He always succeeds. God always wins. He always comes through. He will not fail you. Not only that, but God will not lead you into this battle and then back out and say, wow, I didn't expect this opposition. They really are giants. I knew that, but Joshua, I don't, this doesn't look good, so we're pulling out. God is not going to do that. It's absolute certain promises. So here's the conclusion. He says to Joshua at the end of verse 8, Do not fear or be dismayed. Do not fear or be dismayed. Two very important concepts there. Joshua, first of all, you don't have to be afraid of anything. Okay? Joshua, don't be, you don't have to be. But when you are, 
afraid because you are human. Don't let your fear cause you to fall into dismay. Don't give up and faint because you're afraid. Because Joshua, you are human, and the first giant you walk up against, it's probably going to be terrifying. And you need to know God's already there. You need to go, God is with you. And you need to know that God won't fail you right now. Do not fear or be dismayed. So obviously, today, we are not literally standing on the border of a land that is hostile. We're not trying to take uh, a physical land today. The church is not called to encroach upon enemy territory physically. That's not necessarily, we're not trying to capture a land. But, but what was a physical reality for Israel and Joshua is a spiritual reality for us. And when I say that, I don't want to minimize the literalness of the battle. The battle and the spiritual territory that we're trying to encroach upon and actually invade is just as real as Canaan was. And our enemies are just as real. They're not flesh and blood, but they're very, very real. We do stand today on the verge of being part of God's plan to see an entire city impacted by the church. I believe this. I have formulated this. This is my conviction. This is not, I'm not a prophet speaking for God and saying he told me this. But these are my convictions. Having been in Topeka, Kansas for seven years, having read a lot of books about what God is doing in the ministries and lives of us, having built relationships with other pastors across denominational lines, here's what I'm convinced of. That God is doing something absolutely amazing in Topeka, Kansas. I think it's nationwide. I really do because of the folks that I'm reading, the, the voices that God's raising up as authors and speakers. I think this is nationwide, but I do believe in the next 10 years that the church in Topeka, not just the Southern Baptist Church, but the true church of Jesus Christ will be such a significant force that it will have a literal impact on the culture of this city. I believe in 10 years that God is gonna use the church, that not just this one, but the church all those who trust and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, risen from the dead, the church, to impact everything from divorce rates to violence to addiction to absent parenthood, everything to shape, to begin to shape the culture, to be such a force in the city that we live in that where we vacuumed out, that there would be a noticeable absence in the, in the culture and in the fiber of our city, I believe that. I, I honestly believe that. Again, I, I wasn't w awoken in the middle of the night and God thundered a voice into my heart these, from reading the scriptures and praying and talking and listening and trying to perceive and be an act, a student who could exegete the culture that we live in and the time that we live in. I believe that God is moving in that way. And I say 10 years very vaguely probably because I don't have a timeline, but I believe in that time of scope. I have a sense in that scope of time that God is going to do something amazing. It won't be a government program that pushes back darkness and brings hope and light. It won't be a law that gets enacted? Did you know if Roe v. Wade got, got enforced today, if somehow that happened, it wouldn't change the culture? It wouldn't. It would make abortion illegal, but it wouldn't change the hearts of the people who believe that it's okay. So a law does nothing to change the moral fiber of the country. We're fighting the wrong battle, folks. We really are, and the church has to rise up and see that. We've got to stop hating. We've got to start loving. We've got to start walking with Jesus. What will change this city will be disciples who've been awakened to the urgent need to live out the great commandment, to love God ferociously and to literally love their literal neighbors. That's what will change this city. And I believe that's what's happening today. Even in our own congregation, but again, across denominational borders and walls, God is moving in some amazing, amazing ways I have been hesitant to say such things because they sound trumped up. They sound like I'm trying to make a movement larger than, than it is. So I have, have been hesitant to say it, but I believe it. I really do. But before God can raise up an army, we have to stop letting a roadblock stop us from being obedient to him. The roadblocks of time, the roadblocks of fear, because fear paralyzes obedience to God. Fear paralyzes obedience to God. Left unchecked, fear is going to keep us tucked safely in our living rooms and in this worship center and never risk rejection, never risk 
awkward conversations, and never risk messy relationships because all three of those things are guaranteed when we step into the world of loving our neighbors like we love ourselves. There's no promise that this is going to be a neat, tidy affair. There's no promise that you get to do this and keep life comfortable and cozy like you've always had it. It's the guarantee of the opposite. God's going to bring you into messy, broken people's lives. And, 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 and probably what's going to happen is we're going to realize how messy and broken our own lives are. And our authenticity, if we're willing to do that, will, will invade and creep in and, and help uh, our message be valid. See, fear is going to make us unwilling to sacrifice for anything to advance the gospel. It'll make us unwilling to sacrifice for the important things, and it'll resign us to wandering in a desert while God raises up a generation who will be obedient. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His, his response to Israel will be response to the church today. If we said, for example, as a church, we don't want to be a part of that, that's cost too much, and we wouldn't say it with our lips, and we wouldn't have a business meeting to vote on that. I understand that. But through our actions or our inaction, we said, God, we see what you're doing, but we like it how it is. That's exactly, we have to see, that's exactly what Israel did. Did you know on the, on the border of the Red Sea, when they had already been brought out of, miraculously brought out of Egypt, they blamed Moses. They said, we would have rather stayed and been slaves in Egypt than to die right here. And Moses said, you're going to see the day God of salvation at work here in just a minute. And then when they stood on the brink of the promised land the first time, God didn't say, oh, you blew it. We can't take the promised land. What are we going to do now? God said, we're still going to take the promised land, but you aren't going to be a part of it. So I'm wondering as a church, do we want to be a part of what God's doing in this generation, in this day? Do we really want to be a part of it? Or do we we're more comfortable wandering around in the desert of churches who are mediocre, who are disobedient, who are more concerned about our, our denomination, about our, our, our own sanctity of, of, of social relationships? Are we going to be more concerned about that stuff that doesn't matter to God at all? Or are we going to say, God, take us into a land that's dangerous? And we want to push back darkness and we want to fight the battle and we want to defeat the enemy in the name of Jesus, our King. Anytime we move toward the unknown, fear is going to be a potential obstacle. Your neighbors that are strangers to you, and I've heard some great stories that many of you don't, aren't perfect strangers to your neighbors, and that's awesome. But the, strangers that are na the neighbors that are strangers are oftentimes that way because we're afraid of them, because we've seen something about them. Maybe we've heard yelling from the house. Maybe we've seen them dressed a certain way, or, or maybe we've seen that their values are different than ours, or, or that they, you know, their car never moves on Sunday morning, or, or things that we just come to conclusions about. And then when we come to conclusions apart from relationship, most of the time we're wrong about our conclusions, but we let fear of the unknown replace love for the lost, and we remain separated from our neighbors because of faulty conclusions. Listen, fear is always going to be an obstacle. I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, it's easy to knock on your neighbor's door. It's easy to, to invite them to a block party. It's easy to, to do whatever you know, we decide to do and whatever we come up with. It's not going to necessarily be easy. It wasn't easy for Joshua, even though he had this great man of faith standing here saying, don't be worried, God's ahead of you. He's with you. He won't fail you. It wasn't easy. He still had to overcome fear and to move into the land in spite of it. We're still going to have it. But we need to know these three things too. Here they are. Jesus is already there. When you think about moving towards your neighbor, you need to know that God is already there. He's already in the relationship. He's already preparing the, the conversations. He's already there. You don't have to go over there by yourself because God is already present at work in the lives of those people that he loves. He's still doing what he did some thousands and thousands of years ago today, even on this scale of next door neighbor. Jesus is already there. But you know what? It's the same thing with Joshua as it is today, that Jesus is already with you. He's already present with them, but we need to know that he's already with us. That is, literally picture yourself walking out your front door, walking to your next door neighbor across the street or down the road, and, and imagine that Jesus is already present in their living room, on the front porch, or wherever you meet them, and imagine and picture the reality that he is with you. 
And He is drawing you into that relationship where He is already at work. He is not sending you ahead of Him without Him. He is sending you to where He is and He's going with you as you go. So Jesus said this in the Great Commission where He sent out the, sent out the church. He said, Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age and Jesus won't fail you he's not going to get you over there and say wow you blew that one I had to go home about halfway through that conversation because that was terrible he's not going to do that he's not going to back out on you if he's sending an untrained army of, 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 of pilgrims literally pilgrims into a well fortified city against well trained armies that have giants at their back he can help you move through a conversation with your neighbor successfully, even if you do stick your foot in your mouth, even if you do say something that is likely going to be strange sounding. Do you think that God's going to go, oh my gosh, I mean, you blew that. I'm going home. You're a crazy person. I can't work with you. I can't work with you. It's all done. That God's going to do that? God said to Israel, I won't fail you. I won't forsake you. Even if you blow it, I'm going with you, and I'll redeem it. If you'll just go into the land. See, the only time God says you can't do it is if you won't do it. If you'll have the conversation, if you'll establish the relationship, God will work through clumsy, awkward conversations when you're genuine and when you're authentic to redeem it and to make his name great. Here's our life challenge. I'm going to ask you to do something very simple this week. I want you to start praying for two of your neighbors by name. If you know their names, great. If you don't know their names, step one, get to know their names. I don't know how. Don't, don't, don't go read their mail out of their mailboxes. Bad start. <laughs> don't do Google searches. Just go say, hey, I don't know your name. Even though I've lived here for 12 years, <laughs> I don't know your name. I would love to know your Hi, I'm Casey. Just go get to know their name. And then pray two primary things. Ask the Father to give you a genuine concern for them, okay? Just ask the Father to give you a concern for them, uh, for their welfare. The last thing we need to do is fake it. We, we don't advance the kingdom with actions that are not born from our heart. We don't advance the relationship with inauthentic uh, presence. Second thing, ask the Father to prepare the way and create opportunities for you to connect with him. Again, we're going to give you ideas. We're going to help equip you. But the first thing we have to deal with are these two roadblocks, time and fear. Listen, if you don't deal with those two things, it doesn't matter what else we tell you. If you don't deal with time and fear, you won't move beyond this point that you're at right now. The reason we are where we are, the primary two reasons, time and fear. Okay, so we have to... I will have conversations with you anytime. I can do it on email. I can do it in person. I can do it on phone. If you want to talk through, Nate and I will be more than willing. He doesn't know this, but he is more than willing to sit down and talk to you about how to overcome. Listen, Nate really is quite honestly a, a, a more effective uh, at this than I am. He is a very good neighbor. Uh, he and Sean have done this. They put it into practice. Uh, so they could talk to you about time and fear, and we would be glad to help you. Uh, personally mobilize an army of good neighbors that's what God's calling us to be let's pray together God you are an awesome God and I thank you for the simplicity of this plan and even though it looks like we're staring two giants eyeball to eyeball that are insurmountable God you've called us next door you've called us into that promised land those neighbors that live next to us or down the road or across the street those people that we work with every day day in and day out they are the mission, not to convert them, not to get to, to, to have their name on a roll, but to introduce them to Jesus, to show them Jesus, and to do that authentically. God, that's what we need you to help us do. That's where we sense you calling us. We ask you to empower us. It's in Jesus' great name. Amen. Church, thank you for being so attentive and, and, and listening I want to say just on the chance, I mean, I'm looking at everybody and I think I know every single person in the room, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's why we're here. We want you to. 
if you know somebody who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. I heard this testimony from an atheist at Western Hills Upward Halftime yesterday. An avowed atheist said, if we believe, saying of Christians, what we say we believe, then it is the most cruel thing in the world to not try to win people to faith in Jesus. That he would have great respect for those who try to proselytize, no respect for those that don't. Because there is a great inconsistency there. So let's not beat people with Bibles. Not try to win arguments. Go be Jesus. How? Pastor, how do I do that? Love your neighbor. Just love them like you love yourself. Let's pray. God, you're an amazing God. Speak to us right now. Help us to nail down decisions that we need to nail down and move in our congregation with force and might and with your almighty wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and be responsive to God. last line as thou hast been thou forever will be the same God we just looked at that was with Joshua and Moses the same God who's inviting you into your neighborhood to be a missionary thank you church you can be seated we're going to take up our offering right now and we're going to ask you to give to the mission we are trying to formulate a budget that moves, you can't do it all in one year, but moves incrementally more towards the greatest amount of our resources going to advance the gospel directly, not just paying salaries and bills. Now, we're moving in that direction. It doesn't mean we've accomplished it in one year, but we want you to know that's our heart, and so we ask you to give with the greatest of generosity to fund the mission, not to subsidize an institution we call a church. So give with greatness, okay? Richard, would you pray for our offering today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your message here this morning, not only through the words, but into our hearts, Lord, and let us be bold and trust in you, who has always been trustworthy. Let us be strong in our faith to you, Lord, who has given us our faith, and let us remember that in our midst you placed a rock that cannot be turned, Jesus Christ. So. Today, lead us forward in giving what you've already given us, just giving a portion of your blessings to us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Be strong and take courage. Do not fear or be dismayed, for the Lord will go before you, and his light will show the way, so be strong and take
Beautiful, Renita, thank you. I know that song comes from your heart today. We have uh, just a couple things I'm going to let you go. Especially called business meeting to approve our 2013 budget. Yes, we're a little behind on that process, but we're there. Uh, 3 p.m. on April 10th. We need you to pick up a budget today. Uh, we have to do this. This is the protocol two weeks in advance. Make that known uh, at 3 p.m. That should be a short 15 to 30 minute meeting on that day, okay? But make sure you leave here today with a copy of the budget. They're back there on the table if you didn't get one. Today is Renita's last day with us, uh, serving in that position. Uh, she's going to remain a part of our church family, I know, not necessarily on the rolls, but in our heart. Now, we're going to miss her and Simone greatly. Uh, today is their send-off potluck. It's immediately following the second service, so please, please be here and to celebrate that. And uh, just let them know how much they've meant to you, okay? We will give you time to share during that time uh, the impact that Renita and Simone have had in your life. So if you want to think of a brief story uh, or anecdote to illustrate how God's used them, feel free to do that, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that this afternoon. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. You're dismissed. Yes. If there's a hundred people there and we're all long, we'll be there till tomorrow.